Hello, I'm Stephen Sexton. I'm going to read you a couple of poems. And in the spirit of Advent, which is concerned with the future and arrivals and what's coming, here are a couple of poems concerning that. Uh, for now, I will send my best thoughts to you wherever you are in the future. My second favourite locked room mystery. Since I started working at the bowling alley, I think about it all the time. In his barn, from a high rafter or crossbeam, a man has hanged himself, with no ladder or platform to get him there. Nothing suspicious save a patch of damp on the straw-strewn dirt floor. Cheryl, on the other hand, is really into tarot. When the soda fountain's not so busy, she shuffles up my destiny, and every time she seems to draw the lovers. Think about it, flashes the braces in her smile, and the pin setters chew like beautiful mouths. Thinking about the future always makes me so thirsty. So, while Cheryl sorts out pin jams and inventories the shoes, I slurp a Coke with plenty of chipped ice, and before long my head is full of ice men and their cold chariots, horse-drawn ice ploughs, the lakes of Massachusetts. When she's fed up with kismet, Cheryl lets me build little card castles, and I sometimes think, I could marry her some hot day in the summer, an ice sculpture of a bowling pin undoing itself into a puddle of water at the highest of June. And I think of his horses. What were their names? The Burdens. Before any of it, a goat appeared, in a piebald sweater, beardless and tethered at the collar, on half a tennis court of land, up a rutted lane above the road. Doubtless a horse once clip-clopped there, before a trap, a whip, a tweed of farmer, with bushels and crates of cabbages, parsnips, blue duck eggs, to pay the country doctor. Not now, and not then, we drive home between the fields. She is radioactive, or lately was, and sleeps on the doses of nitrogen mustard a country doctor has called for. Little goat, forgive me, I shouldn't do this. All you do is munch your poxy plain of grass, your kingdom for a caper. If at night you sing your tired chin to sleep, it's not a metaphor, it's a tragedy. Instead, let's say a ship arrived one day. Let's say its decks were delicate, polished oak. Let's say happy, impossible winds steered it. Let's say the captain, sweeping his spyglass over the hills after all this time, find us. The Impossible. Beyond the canopy of oaks, the path we walk most evenings perseveres. The medieval church holds out in ruins. Squirrels love their perpendicular lives. A breeze brings news of the river on the air, and not exactly the scrape of stonemasons at work on the tombstone of our times, but an apprenticeship of skateboarders chiseling shivers of concrete from our civic spaces, softening gently brutal edges, boys and girls who bail 19 times out of 20, committed to impossible revolutions of the board about both axes, and fracturing a wrist sometimes, or an ankle beyond the walking off of it, and so, lentissimo, paramedics cross the square. 
And is it a muster of overshirts, a caravan of backpacks following in the ambulance's wake? Or each alone with gravity and the good new road tarmacadamed smooth as time, downhill sooner than home and quick? That's politics. However, the good news is of the cafe bar, which not unlike everything is coming soon. The Dancers All the syrup-lighted afternoon I watch the office block be dismantled into discretions. Half-moon desks rolled like a fibreboard month across the gummy carpet. The clank and tango of a filing cabinet impressed by three stout men towards the backmost stairwell, where the line of people standing one abreast Snakes throughout the building's seven floors. I water the feeble mint and the oregano flowers and the hyacinths in the shade of my balcony, and the whippings start up again in the street below. On a bus somewhere, or a train, you come towards me, and the second-generation children singing pop songs on the mezzanine, approximating the dance routines whose fortunes of language they cannot cherish yet. You'll say I've never felt such uncomplicated joy, and we'll stand there in the hall with your suitcases, listening to whatever rendition, whatever song, and you'll say what a thing to share this flake of time in their company. What a thing wild lavender can still flourish in the grounds of the derelict church. The Messages On Sunday afternoons the price of broccoli may well drop by 80%. The noodles bear the pallor of the travel sick. But the uncontracted can't be picky. Though the troubled, otherworldly stare of hunger only adds to the spooky aesthetic, lazy or at their wits end detectives expect from their local psychic correspondent. Should the missing person remain undiscovered in the abandoned trophy factory and the only recourse be supernatural, it's Cheryl who is waiting by the phone. Hers is a dying trade. There's no future in it, she'd say. But a gift wasted is a sin, however hard it is raising handfuls of boys on a couple of hours of work a month and agony anting for glossy magazines. But harder is catching the cashier's eye and not seeing the routine mysteries of love and divorce. But a moonlit winter's night, a multi-storey car park a decade away, from somewhere a flash of bristling rage. And knowing the boys will be teenagers by then, or were already, or never won't be.